Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Strategic Command World War I, a new turn-based strategy and war game out by uh, Fury Software and published by Matrix and Slytherin Games. This is our ninth episode, I think it is, or sorry, no, eighth episode uh, of the series where we're playing as the Central Powers. Uh, we are moving into 1915, and so far the war's gone reasonably well. We have Serbia on sort of the verge of defeat, Bulgaria has joined the central powers of Austria, Hungary, and Germany uh, in the in the First World War. Russia has a large pocket of their soldiers surrounded near Warsaw. And while the British did join the war on the side of the Entente, they joined and invaded uh, Belgium with the French. So there are actual Belgian forces fighting with us against the French as well. And clearly, uh, the central powers in this conflict have the moral high ground, given they didn't violate the neutrality of Belgium. This was taken from a live stream from a few days ago, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump out of here and jump back into the live stream as we end this turn at the end of January and move into the spring of 1915. Hope you guys enjoy the video, let me know your thoughts below, and I'll catch you guys at the end. And see what happens. Bulgaria's entrance into the war reduces Serbian national morale. Austria-Hungary welcomes Bulgaria's entrance into the war. Italian nationalists call for Italy to enter the war. The Ottoman Empire prepares for war. I'm glad we didn't spend 150 points on their diplomacy. Canadian Expeditionary Force completes its training. Artisan Schnauzer, thank you very much for the follow. That is a great name. Workers on the Clyde strike over working conditions. I like how you've got the little red icon. It's supposed to represent workers of the world unite. Dozens are killed when Indian soldiers mutiny in Singapore. Interesting. Pro-German Boer revolt in South Africa is crushed. D.W. Griffith, The Birth of a Nation is re released at the cinema. Eek. International Anarchy Manifesto Against the War is published in England. Yes, yeah, stoke the fires of rebellion. Overthrow your masters. Watch out for Entente troops coming from neutral Greece as historically did. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a concern. I'm hoping that doesn't happen until much later in the war, per history. Meanwhile, our subs are getting hit pretty hard by British uh, destroyers. In both sections, although in that case the sub shot back better. Meanwhile, it seems like most of the British destroyers are probably to the west. So that should limit the effectiveness of their uh, of their navy against us in a, in a naval battle. Looks like the British deployed a battlecruiser forward into the Adriatic. It suffered some damage. I think they just knocked our sub off one of the national morale lines. My fleet isn't quite at 100%. I lost the I lost effective use of several of my warships fighting the uh, fighting the Russian naval elements in my campaign against uh, Riga. Meanwhile, a bunch of Russian units are moving around via rail. Reinforcements. Allied units on the western front are shifting around. I'm still having a really hard time gauging how well or poorly we're doing, to be honest. If, if the Netherlands would just give me free transport through their land, that would be great. It would make things a lot easier. Right now I've got a super thin line to Antwerp. But I don't want to evacuate it because I don't want Bel Bel Belgium to surrender. I don't. As long as I have a couple of extra troop units in the west, which actually are very good troop units. They're all level 1 experience. So that really helps. As long as I have them there, I want to. I guess I want to kind of keep them. British troops moving against the Belgian Belgian garrison to the west of Antwerp. That guy's kind of a sacrificial lamb. He's probably going to die this turn anyway. There he does. But he did eat up six or seven enemy attacks this turn, which I'm completely okay with. Russian troops near Gumdeden move an attack in a winter storm in February of 1915. They suffer 40% casualties without inflicting any noticeable casualties against their German opponents. A disaster for the Corps. Meanwhile, interesting, the British decide to move their battlecruiser into the port of Durazzo. Rather than try and retreat it, they move into, into port. 
Okay. It's an interesting move. I mean, I can't effectively attack it, but I can certainly bottle it up. I wonder what the Italian uh, war stance is at this moment. It's obviously they're, they're, they're shifting toward war. We might want to spend some diplomacy to try and arrest their, their, their shift toward war. French attacks to the south of Toul against our troops in garrison there does not go over well. I imagine attacking trench lines in the winter with defensive artillery is not the best thing to do. I don't know if ships in port give any defensive bonuses to the troops there. I do know that you can't really attack them with, with land units very well. Or sorry, with naval units very well. I've got a little bit of a cold. Italy did not join the Central Powers at first. Italy was allied to the Central Powers through the Triple Alliance, but they actually they made the argument that it was a defensive alliance only and that the First World War was not a defensive war, that the Germans and the Austrians uh, actually made the first attacks and therefore they were not bound by their alliance, and then they eventually ended up joining the Entente in 1915 sometime. Ottoman forces are mobilizing throughout the Middle East. So you can see a lot of Ottoman units here deploying on the map. The interesting thing about this war is that because we didn't attack Belgium and because Britain stayed neutral, the game said that the British actually deployed the Osman I, which was the Agincourt battleship. They gave it to the, to the Ottomans. They were building it for the Ottomans, but historically they, they held it back and they, they enlisted it into the, uh, the British Navy. Well, as a result of us not attacking Belgium and the British deploying that troop, that unit, the British were short one battleship of what they historically had. The Ottomans had that battleship, and we also sent the Gubin there. So the, the Italians have the Gubin, and they have the Osman I. They have two newish, modern battleships. Uh, Time Achiever 605, thank you very much for the follow. Armenian Uprising in Van. A giant locust swarm wreaks havoc around Jerusalem. Indian forces suffer casualties seizing Basra. A typhus epidemic breaks out among the Ottoman forces in the Caucasus. Just great. Foreign Minister reports diplomatic success in the Netherlands, swinging at 6% toward the Entente. That's actually okay. It's 20% toward the Axis, or the Central Powers. I keep saying Axis. The Central Powers, right now... But I don't actually want it to join the war on our side, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, Jatsy, although I would say in this case the, the Allies actually attacked Belgium first. Russian trade can no longer pass through the Dardanelles. Sheikh ul Islam proclaims a jihad against the Entente. Ottoman Finance Minister Mehmet Kavit Bey resigns in protest against the war. The Kedev Abes II of Egypt promises to help drive the British from the e from Egypt. Interesting. Did that historically happen? I mean, they didn't drive him from Egypt. The British depose Kede the Kedev and appoint Hussein Kamel as Sultan of Egypt. Okay. So the lots of lots of summer events occurred this turn. Aiding the Ottoman Empire, for as long as there is a clear route via Serbia and Bulgaria to Constantinople, we can send aid to our Ottoman ally and help them in the war against the Entente. The fall of Basra is a painful loss, and we should consider taking action here. Suleiman Asri Bey, head of our special op, uh, organization, asked for permission to form a unit of volunteers in Mesopotamia to strike back at the British. Additionally, a German officer, Captain Fritz Klein, is volunteering to lead a mission to sabotage production at the Abedin oil refinery. Forming the Ashkiri Volunteer Detachment and providing Klein with the means to lead his mission will cost us 50 MPPs. Would you like to authorize the payments? Saying yes will reduce the enemy's ability to adva advance fur thur further into Mesopotamia and Klein's mission has a 75% chance of damaging the refinery, in which case enemy income will suffer slightly. 
Suleiman Eskari was named governor and military command commandant at ba of Basra. A force of 4,000 regulars and 15,000 irregulars was mustered for an attack on Basra, but it failed, and then he committed suicide. Klein's team was more successful as it did manage to damage uh, 12 miles of pipeline at the Abaddon refinery, but this only deprived the UK of 70 gallons of oil. All right, we'll uh, mobilize the troops near Baghdad. Thousands of Georgian Muslims have crossed the border from Russian territory to offer their services in the coming conflict. We could form them into a detachment to help us take back the provinces we lost to Russia in the War of 1877 to 1878. Forming this volunteer detachment will cost us 50 MPPs. Okay. Saying yes to this may be wise because it will increase Ottoman strength in this area, and it could be crucial if the Russians decide to launch a strong offensive here. Okay. Wait, what did I do? Oh. Yes. Georgian volunteers assemble to help fight the Russians. Second German artillery is ready to deploy. We're going to deploy them in the east. Near Tannenberg. The Austrians, meanwhile, have a new sub. So that's good. We also have artillery. That's good. The Russians are really mustering a large number of troops here. Meanwhile, another Austro-Hungarian Corps is being formed. All right, so I think we, in order to strengthen our position here, cutting these troops off, who are not yet out of supply, and in fact, I'm not sure they're ever actually any worse than they were before, I do need to, to move some troops around. So these German troops are going to move here, move this German unit here, this... Austrian formation we may move well let's see we can probably attack the flank of these troops here one to one we'll do one to one because they're ten they didn't lose anything nice and we drove them back that's a very good result one to four wow that, those are good numbers we just destroyed a Russian core hell yeah I should not have actually done that. All right, so we just... I could have attacked this headquarter unit, Bruce Love. Maybe I should have. Elros, thanks for the follow. Um, but I also didn't want to get these guys completely cut off and easily destroyed, so I decided not to. So we just destroyed a Russian core here. That should weaken them. We also are extending our front near Koval. Meanwhile, we've got the troops at random are cut off. They're down to one supply point. So we'll hopefully finish them off with relative ease. This cavalry unit here. All right. So we destroyed a Russian core there. To the south of Warsaw at random Poland. Meanwhile, we probably want to take Ivangrod, as it is a secondary source of supply. Although I'd, I actually have pretty good odds of attacking some of these other troops. So I'm guessing the fact that we've had them surrounded for a couple turns now is going to play into our favor. So what makes the most sense to attack? Uh... Let's just reduce these guys over here first. So it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be bloodless. Swap these guys out. Alright, so we just destroyed another Russian core over here. Numrut, thanks for the follow as well. 
So a Russian core destroyed at Radom, a Russian core destroyed to the east of Warsaw. We can do one to three down here. What is the city again? Lublin. So one to three down here. All right, so we just destroyed another Russian core down in this city. Can we reinforce these guys? One point. All right, so... All right, so two of the, th actually three of the Russian cores in this pocket have been destroyed. One at Radom, one at Lublin, one to the east of Warsaw. That leaves eight more Russian cores all surrounded. Meanwhile, there's a Russian core to the east of Gumdubin, or however you pronounce that. That's in bad shape. We'll go ahead and destroy it. Also attack this Russian artillery over here. Uh, the troops at Riga are going to stay in place. Reinforce these guys by one. Alright. So good results there. We've got two fresh cores at Johann or Johannesburg. But they can't quite get to where they need to. So we'll advance with our cavalry over here. Mainly as just a diversion. Again, we don't want a strong Russian effort to break out. I'm hoping that the lack of supply will prevent any sort of effective breakout. The main concern is sort of in the center of this pocket. These units here are somewhat weakened. Actually, to that effect... These guys can both attack. Let's try to destroy these guys because these are 10. A strength of 10. Should, should prevent them from, you know, thinking much of a breakout. So we just reduced 40% effectiveness of this core. Again, the real risk is over here where there's a large bulk of Russian troops, but we attacked and destroyed a core over here as well. So that's probably about it. These guys' morale is really low too. Below 50% for all these troops who are cut off. Serbian morale is down to 43%. Russian morale is at 70%. Germany's morale is still high at 92 And Austria-Hungary actually has 97 morale. So the Austro-Hungarians are very confident. Okay, we'll continue to use our air force ineffectually. Meanwhile, in Serbia, can we reduce these guys yet? 
All right, we'll have the Germans attack first. We'll take a few casualties, but that should that gets rid of the fortification there. Then the Austrians will attack. These guys move south here to do two to one. Actually, two to zero. These Germans will come down here. And there you have it. The final city in Serbia, or the final capital in Serbia, has been destroyed. Continued attacks all along the lines. We'll get in behind them here at Perch. Destroy the Serbian core at Perch. That's another national morale city for the Serbians. Okay, so we are now driving. We're driving them! Alright, so we're now driving into the heart of what's left of Serbia. Some of our units didn't move. This Austrian core probably is unnecessary, so let's actually, what's the dip diplomatic situation? Italy's up to 53% in favor of joining the war. To that end, I'm going to go ahead and invest German diplomacy, 300 MPPs to try and delay it. We're going to also invest Italian MP or Austro-Hungarian MPPs, 300 MPPs on their end to try and delay it. A 20% chance of success against the Italians. Again, we can't stop them from entering the war, but we do want to delay their entry to war. So 20% chance of success for our, our diplomats there. So the fall of Perch, the fall of Uskeb, the Serbians are going to surrender. The question is whether their troops actually do. Uh, meanwhile, the... I feel like the Bulgarians... What's the diplomatic situation with Romania right now? They're 20% in favor of Russia. So we're actually going to go ahead and we're going to take this uh, Bulgarian core. And we're going to rail it to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. to try and help reduce this pocket of Russian troops. Meanwhile, we'll leave the garrisons in place. The Ottomans are at war. We don't have any reason to leave this unit at Adrianople, so we'll go ahead and move these guys to Gallipoli, and we'll go ahead and entrench here with three sides. Meanwhile, the Ottoman Navy is not quite ready for action. Some of its vessels are not fully built up, but the Yavuz Sultan Salim battlecruiser is the Gobin, and then the Sultan Osman I dreadnought is also ready for sea. And so one might wonder... I guess we don't have the port facilities at the moment. So we should probably send these guys to different ports where we can make them repair them. You know, look, these guys are going to reinforce. We really need to spend a bunch of money re bringing our Ottoman troops up to strength. Trezbond. Parisium. We'll reinforce this headquarter unit to full strength. We'll attack the Russians at cars. Attempting to overwhelm them, although not quite successfully. Might have been better if we hadn't reinforced that core and we had attacked with two cores against cars. That would have hurt the Russian morale. Meanwhile, the British... We'll leave, uh, we'll leave the garrison, the volunteer detachment, back behind in Baghdad. We're going to move the 13th Corps forward toward Basra. We also need to move an army south toward Egypt. I'm not going to invade Egypt at this time. I'm going to entrench on three sides at Gaza. 
move these guys forward here. We're going to entrench them as well on three sides. Okay. Are there partisan hexes? There are. So we need to move these guys here. Actually, we should have one south of here. So there are a couple of partisan hexes, which I'm assuming are, are meant to represent Lawrence of Arabia. I'm also hoping the British don't land any troops along our coast. Because that would be bad. Meanwhile, these troops... So Smyrna, I don't like, I don't know what I have to, where I have to keep troops to prevent landings. I don't have any money left to do anything. These guys can't entrench though, so we'll entrench on three sides. Um... I don't think a Russian amphibious landing is likely at, at this stage, so we'll kind of keep these guys here. Yeah, so far the pincer movement in Russia is working reasonably well. There's eight more units that are cut off. The Russian army consists of 59 troops. They are growing rapidly, so they must still be mobilizing. Which is a little bit concerning. Despite all the casualties. The uh, the Russians here, you can see their losses in terms of casualties. That's turned 450 MPPs worth of lost units. Their income is small. How is it so low? That can't really mean their income is less than 50, right? Oh wait, that's got to be Serbia. Yeah, that's Serbia. Never mind. Russia has an income of just shy of 300, but they've lost over 1,000 MPPs worth of units this turn, so it's not exactly cheap for them. German casualties are pretty high, but actually less than their income still, not counting like things like diplomacy. Austria-Hungary sit in a similar boat. The British income, meanwhile, is about 210. You can see they made some massive investments when they went to war. National morale, well, it doesn't really matter. We'll look at that stuff another time. All right, so to the Western Front. So we attacked with those guys so they're not entrenched anymore. All right, so we just destroyed a French core here south of Nancy. Germans could advance theoretically here. I don't know if we want to. What's recon says over here? I mean, I don't. If I could attack, I could advance these guys and attack these French aircraft. We'll hold off on doing that right now. Um, so I think we'll mainly hold the line there. Belgian troops will continue to hold in Antwerp. Belgian headquarters are going to, to operate into Germany, I think. Oh, they can't operate out of their own territory. Interesting. I don't have the reserves, I feel like, to be as aggressive as I would like to be. <laughs> so I would, admittedly, what I'd like to do is I'd like to attack this unit. I'd like to advance these guys here, maybe attack the headquarters unit, try and knock this unit out here. 
But I don't really have much in the way of reserves. So if we attack this guy, fall back here. All right, so we destroyed that French core. Nice. All right, so we we nearly destroyed Lanzarax HQ. We destroyed two French corps, but our troops here are not dug in, and so they will be vulnerable to French counterattack. Now, fortunately, because we were able to advance twice, we're not actually in a salient ourselves. We also have Verdun only... Verdun's supply situation is probably pretty tenuous. If we could attack here, we could probably start to reduce the supply in Verdun and start the historical battle of Verdun, but this might have been overly aggressive. Still the destruction of seven points in a French HQ and two French infantry corps, I do think is worth something. So, not really a breakthrough per se, but some success. We'll shift these troops north. I'm not going to advance into this salient as much as I would like to move these guys down here. They'd be able to attack this French aircraft unit. I mean, I guess it's unlikely that they could attack all of our salients, right? They might destroy one core. Certainly possible. So I did it. I advanced there too. Unwisely, I'm sure. So we now have a salient here, and then we've got a salient here, because there are enemy troops on four sides here. The Belgians are pro-German, Sir Moose Jaws, because the, the Allies, when they could not break through the front in France, invaded Belgium. Goddamn inf treacherous and infernal British. That's what... That's why... All right, um, so German national morale is at 91%, the Austrians are at 97, because the Austrians really haven't lost anything yet, and they haven't lost much in the way of casualties. The Serbians are about to surrender, they lost their last capital, their morale's down to 40%, the Russians are under 70%, the French are almost to 80, and the British are about 90. Meanwhile, I'm really tempted, if I can identify some British naval vessels that are not in port. Like, where is the British Navy? Where is the frickin' Royal Navy? There's a couple of units here, some light cruisers. There's a bunch of destroyers hunting our subs. Where's the damn British Navy? Are they in the channel? Those are mines. I don't know where the British Navy is. They're not at Newcastle. They're not at Dundee. There could be a ship at Rawsythe. They could be north of Scapa. Yeah. But they're mostly at port here. Hmm. We can't quite get there either. So I'm going to assume the Allies won't have recon over here. I'm going to move my fleet into the North Sea. We're not going to quite get all the way up to the British, but I'm hoping that they don't know I'm over here. Still with an easy recall of Germany. Actually, that might be bad. They might be able to see me over there. Now, if I'm on a coastline, even if it's neutral, I wonder if they can actually see me.
Oh, no, I didn't want to do that. Well, I guess I'm moving my fleet up now because I got to protect the seaplane tender. I wanted it to use its scouting capabilities. Not to deploy the fleet over there. Oh, well. I'll just pivot this way with my back to, Den to Norway. Although using a moving unit twice, I've been told, is very bad from their uh, from an efficiency perspective. Although maybe that was actually... I think that was actually a different game I was thinking of. Alright. These subs are going to move west to support. So we've got a sub blocking the Strait of Dover. We've got subs scouting in the north along the, the northern blockade line. Our fleet, meanwhile, is moving along the Norwegian coast, still within recall range of Germany, uh, or at least the ability to fall back through the Kattegat and into the, the Baltic. Um, we'll see if the British Navy comes out to fight. We can see this Gideon Armored Cruiser is at 60% strength. They've got some light cruisers in the northern blockade line. We've scouted out almost the entire western portion of Britain. We, ha we even scouted in toward London Harbor and Dover. We, we don't see any sign of the Royal Navy. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're shifting to do like a Jutland. Maybe they're trying to move against the Austro-Hungarians. Um, they do have a, a, a battle cruiser at Durazzo. I mean, they could legitimately be trying to... I guess we probably want our destroyer here. Where did I deploy that new... Oh, the new sub's here. Um, I've already lost one of our battle cruisers. I, I definitely don't want to lose another... Or our pre-dreadnought battleships, the Austro-Hungarian Navy. I definitely don't want to lose another, but I don't want to just let them escape either. So we'll see. The Adriatic is narrow. They won't be able to efficiently move through here. So we'll see. We'll attack here just to reduce the fortifications. I didn't actually lose any casualties, so that worked perfectly. Although I guess that doesn't really matter in the... Well, move over here, and then if I attack them again, will I get rid of the fortifications? Yes, they're down to zero fortifications. So by doing this, by attacking here, they're down to zero fortifications. They'll start next turn with one, uh, but then we should be able to hopefully overwhelm them. I'm hoping next turn we can take... Uh, or if not take, invest Tiriana, the capital of uh, Albania, and then also hopefully uh, threaten s so that in two months, so that by, I guess it's March of 1915, so that by June of, or May of 1915, we can knock out Albania, Montenegro, and Serbia should already be falling. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and jump in and uh, cut this episode off here. This seems like a good stopping point as any. Um, we have conquered uh, the final capital in Serbia. We have seen the Ottoman Empire join the war on our side. And overall, things in the war seem to be going pretty well for the Central Powers. The Ottoman Empire, Belgium, Bulgaria, Austria-Hungary, and Germany are all in the Central Powers uh, fighting against just the remnants of Montenegro, Albania, Russia, uh, maybe, I think Serbia is kind of, well, they're going to surrender as soon as the next turn ends, uh, France and Great Britain. So it's a pretty interesting coalition of forces on each side. Uh, a little bit atypical, ahistorical, but it's been a lot of fun either way. With that being said, that's enough of me rambling around. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. Hope you guys are enjoying the series. Please let me know your thoughts below, as always. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.